Good morning. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it is uh, the session on defense reform and military transformation in a changing world uh, at the School of Security Studies uh, Conference of, the, of King's College London. I am Dr. Ben Snemat, uh, a lecturer at the Defense Studies Department. And uh, today we are going to listen to uh, amazing young scholars from different universities. Uh, about how transformation and, and military reform is going on in different settings and in different uh, armed forces. Uh, we will listen to Lucy Pibe from uh, the University of Bath, uh, then Mehmet Sahim from uh, King's College London. Uh, he's at the De Department of Defense Studies, Honor Kara, also King's College Department of War Studies, and uh, Tamaris Santos from Cranfield University. And, uh, and this topic is, uh, is very important because what we see that normally, uh, at least the literature says that uh, uh, militaries don't like to change and don't like to uh, learn as much as we would expect. It has its reason. Uh, the reason is that uh, um, armed forces are building up very rigid hierarchical, uh, extremely formal organizations. And they do this for a reason. Uh, they have to cope with uh, huge uncertainties in the battlefield and huge un uncertainties in domestic and international political environments as well. So what they are doing, they try to create certainties from these uncertainties. And, um, and, um, and when they're doing this, they are focusing on creating rigid and robust hierarchies and also uh, standard operating procedures, because this is how you can create uh, kind of stability in your organization. It is, it is very good and it is very useful because it creates robustness and you can uh, answer to the problems that you prepare for, but uh, it, is, it is also a big enemy for change and, and, and uh, different defense reforms. So uh, the literature and scholars are working out how armed forces can do this the best way. But we know in general, the literature says that that uh, armed forces are learning and changing very slowly, incrementally, or they don't learn, they don't change, but if they do, they do incrementally. Uh, and it is very exceptional if they do uh, big reforms, systematic reforms uh, throughout the organization relatively quickly. So this is the context, uh, what we know in general. And uh, first we are going to listen to Lucy Pibe, who is researching France uh, and how France is transforming its army. And uh, she's focusing on tensions, dynamics, and uh, the quest of balance. So Lucy, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for the introduction. So I'm just gonna try and put my PowerPoint on and then I'll, I'll get started. Can you, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, so yes, today I'm offering a psychologically and culturally oriented reading of uh, strategic and military studies, relying on ontological security to further understand why and how the French Land Army is transforming. So the purpose of this study is to have a better understanding of the French um, army model and its recent and ongoing transformations. So, so to answer this, um, this research question, I argue that um, military transformation is a way to rebalance the end ways and means model, and also highlight the relevance and the permanence of French strategic and military cultures. So um, before introducing the methodology of my study, I'm briefly gonna define ontological security theory um, because I'm using it as a um, theoretical framework. I think it's, an, it's important to have a good understanding of the theory um, because it, it's, it's actually how I'm gonna develop my, it'll get a better understanding on how I'm gonna develop my arguments. So for those who are not familiar with ontological security theory, um, the theory broadens the survival assumption by um, offering a two layered conception of security. So basically both physically and ontological security matters. Ontological security is the security of the self, so the, the actor's identity. So this theory originated in um, psychology and sociology and has been appropriated um, by the IR scholarship who's scaled up um, the theory from the individual to the nation state. 
So in my study, I'm, I'm following the IR contribution. So claiming the individual need for ontological security can be scaled up to nations. But I also argue ontological security can be scaled up to in institutions. So by that, I mean that both nations and institutions are driven, driven by the need to be ontologically secure. So following my understanding of ontological security, I'm, I'm here proposing a two level analysis um, with a third first part looking at a strategic level, so France, and the second part looking at a lower institutional level, uh, so the French land army. I use thematic analysis relying on qualitative data of interviews of experts and um, officers, um, of, like French transformation experts and officers, official de documents and existing literature. Um, so I rely on ontological security, so OS, uh, to highlight the role of culture and identity in military transformation. But if OS is what, is what drives transformation, so it's an overarching and objective goal, culture um, and identity shape transformation. They're, in that sense, I mean that it's a subjective role and actor specific. So that's where uh, strategic culture and military culture come in as analytical tools, sorry. So I'm going to start by analyzing, uh, by explaining, sorry, how French strategic culture not only shapes the French army model in its transformation, it also drives military transformation. When we look at the tensions between strategic ambitions and uh, defense budget, we can ask ourselves, why is um, France not revising its strategy in the, sh in the face of uh, growing tensions between the ends and the means? I argue that the need for OS pushes France not to review its strategic ambition shared by, uh, that are shaped by French strategic culture. So as such, French strategic culture contributes to military transformation. Globalization um, is also a catalyst of both physical and ontological insecurity and paired with the lack of French strategic vision, which have um, been highly stressed in the interviews um, of French experts and officers give more importance and relevance to French strategic culture, which along with other factors, function as a framework, a, a guide for action. So as it influences action, it's important to define French strategic culture. What is French strategic culture and how does it translate into strategy? So I have a historical understanding of strategic culture and I use a concept-based approach. The concepts at the heart of French strategic culture are rooted in history. So the French Revolution and the Enlightenment period being really influential. And, I've and those have developed over time, uh, including for institutionalization. I identify a number of core concepts, including universalism, humanism, particularism, and independence. These all relate to the meta concept of exceptionalism. So this idea that France is special and unique. And um, those are actually two complementary aspects uh, that relate to this meta concept. So on the one hand, France sees itself um, and its values as special, so they should be shared by all. And on the other hand, France is unique and should foster its singularity through strategic autonomy and independence. The last concept I identify is activism. Um, so that's the idea that France does not just uh, talk, it also acts, uh, so it engages in both soft power and hard power. And that again can be um, linked and connected to the French Revolution because there's this idea that you need to fight for, for the values and for, um, for your ideas. So these concepts translate today uh, quite evidently in a high ambitious uh, strategic agenda that is structured around power projection, interventionism and strategic autonomy. So what does that mean for the French um, land army? It means that it needs to, to do a lot uh, with not so much, and that entails a constant quest for balance. So this helps us understand the army model and um, its transformation, and on what it invests and prioritizes when it comes to transformation. So I've listed three um, examples of core traits defining French army model, along with the kind of positives and negative um, uh, consequences or that might be associated to those. So first, French model is an all capacity model. So it's the only army in Europe to be able to offer this full, full spectrum and um, all capacity model. So hypothetically, this would mean that the army can undertake a wide variety of tasks, missions and strategic requirements. 
So it gives them the strategic autonomy that they're looking for, while at the same time making them an attractive partner. But limited means means it's um, it results in limited capabilities. So what the French call the capacité échantillonnaire. So that ex impacts the extent and the duration in which um, they can act. And, um, and that's especially the case if they engage in a high intensity scenario, for instance. So linked to the, um, the culture of acti activism, the second trait is the fact that the French army is active and experienced. So the French army is used to fighting, uh, which improve efficiency and avoids a, a disconnect with the art and the act of war. Again, this is an advantage when it comes to cooperation because it makes them a credible partner, credible force. Experts and officers consulted for the study have also highlighted uh, how this culture of getting things done improves transformation and efficiency. Oper operational experiences make transformation an ongoing requirement, uh, so that keeps the model up to date and also makes it uh, arguably more efficient. So it also fosters this mentality of self-criticism and strengthens lessons learned processes. That's again, something that's been highlighted in the interviews. But this culture of activism and the multiplicity of engagement also varies the men and the equipment and uh, the risk of overstretching the forces are constant. And that's even more true now that we're looking into turning to high intensity um, warfare. So it's important to also highlight that over the last 30 years, the French army has focused on counterinsurgency and, it, and that made all other kind of conflict foreign for the French army. Um, and the French officers, although they embrace the turn to high intensity warfare, they are not um, seeing a future without overseas operation and interventions. So there's a kind of another problematic there of, of overstretching the force once again. So finally, the last trait here is um, the, the general approach to transformation and training. So because France wants strategic autonomy and has power projecting ambitions, it needs to be able to act autonomously like I highlighted earlier and uh, cover these wide range of missions and strategic re requirements. As such, it takes a proactive approach to transformation that, that is structured first around the Scorpion program, which is um, a modernization of the um, army around one core system, so the digitalization of the force. So uh, this holistic approach allows for a more coherent model. Uh, the, the idea of a general approach transformation is also embraced more broadly in the training of the force and the, and the overall mentality, where in France, um, the army insists you um, soldier before anything else. So before being a, an engineer, before being a paratrooper, you are a French soldier. So that's another idea that's very permanent. Um, so with this example, I've demonstrated how French strategic culture influences the army and its transformation. And here I'm looking at the institutional level and argue the, uh, the, milit the army sorry, also seeks to be physically and ontologically secure. Uh, so physical um, so survival is dependent to both international and domestic uh, dynamics. So first it shows through the necessity to adapt and to remain relevant in a changing world with strategic failures of forever wars, evolving threats and technologies. Uh, the current transformation is structured around high intensity, large scale conflicts and the Scorpion program, answering both the questions of threats and technologies. And the army's proactive approach to transformation is also driven by the fear to, uh, to lose a war because um, it does not transform. And that's due to the history of past failures. So an officer has explained, I quote, we are haunt haunted by these anticipation failures and we seek to avoid them. Uh, second, physical survival of the army is dependent to society and the political sphere who it answers to. So that also has an impact on um, the army model and its transformation. First, when the army is unable to prove its value, it runs the risk of further, suffering further budget cuts. And that was very true during the Sarkozy presidency in France. Um, and an officer explains of that period, we are in a deep crisis. The workforce is cut down in all sides, we're dying. And the obsession of the land army's chief of staff is to say we need to justify our existence. So there we see again the need to justify the army's value, puts the focus away from efficiency. And Operation Sentinelle is a strong example of this, um, as it's an operation that gives a mission to the army. So it's um, counterterrorism on the homeland, but it has no strategic relevance and very costly. So you can see that kind of disconnect. 
um, that affects efficiency. On the other hand, there's also the need to be ontologically secure uh, that influences the model uh, and its transformation. And to elucidate how military truck culture might influence the model and its transformation, I'll just mention a couple of um, concepts because I think I'm going to be running out of time. Uh, so the tensions at the strategic level have developed French qualities, um, such as adaptation and rusticity. So those push the army to think more creatively, for example, but also to, um, to be able to function in the harsh conditions. So that's kind of positive aspects, but there's also uh, the fact that French um, autonomy also strengthens uh, subsidiarity, for example, so France does not really work with NATO standards, and that can be an, an issue when it comes to cooperation. So that's kind of all the elements that show that there's strength and weaknesses that are connected to the French military culture. So um, I can't really develop any further, so I'll go to my concluding remarks. Uh, so the French army model is one of balance. Uh, it developed with the influence of strategic and military cultures and tensions between the ambition and the means, making both at the same time, like I said, the strength, but also the weaknesses of the French army model. Uh, I would also like to add that the French land army um, has a very generally positive view of its army model and the uh, ongoing transformation and how it sees its future. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Excellent. It was an excellent presentation. Uh, I, will, I will ask a question. You don't have to don't answer now, just in the Q&A. So it's, but if uh, anyone from the audience want to ask a question, we have this Q&A button and uh, you can type your questions there. And uh, after uh, every presenter gave her or his presentation, uh, we will try to answer all the questions. And, and Lucy, I'm just, I'm just a question that you might want to think while the others are presenting that, but we, but we see in the British military that um, for the last 30 years, uh, the main themes in, uh, for instance, in the, in the strategy documents are remained the same or remained very similar. So although the British armed forces are transforming, but what we can see that the core themes are, are changing incrementally. And uh, we also see the full spectrum of capabilities, joint uh, operations, or, or working with allies. And it seems to me that 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 the the French armed forces have also this kind of core teams that full spectrum of capabilities, their experienced uh, army, uh, general approach to transformation. How do you see these core teams helping, or also maybe? pulling the French military back from transformation, because if you don't change or adopt your core teams, it also might show some stagnation, not only just transformation. So it is my question uh, to the Q&A. Okay, excellent. That is, it was a very good presentation. Excellent. So now uh, we will uh, have uh, Mehmet Sahim, who is uh, a PhD student at the uh, uh, Defense Studies Department at, at King's College London. And uh, and his uh, research focusing on uh, uh, the Turkish defense offset regulations, why and how they have changed through the years, uh, I mean, for the, for the last 20 years, basically. Mehmet, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for your um, introduction. Um, now I will basically, what I'm going to do is, I will basically start with explaining what defense offsets regulations are and why countries um, use them. And then I will give a brief explanation of the background of Turkey until the 2002, um, just to give a sense to how the changes, uh, the how, how the changes make sense and how how they connect to each other. And then I will explain. There are like basically uh, five different documents that were um, released in uh, years 1991. 2000, 2003, 2007, and 2011. Um, you don't have to memorize the years. I will explain all of them. And I will explain how slowly it changed in years from um, the, the purpose of using defense offsets regulations. It changed from defense industrialization to into ecosystem building. And then it changed into general, like it changed into general tool of industrialization. Like, so it also included civil purposes uh, in years. So starting with the defense offset regulations. 
So what are they? They are basically um, compensation practices that are required as a condition of a purchase on either government to government or commercial sales of defense articles or and or defense services. So what this, this means is basically it's because these are huge transactions when countries um, um, when countries buy the uh, defense products or services um, not to lose too much foreign currency not, not to be able to not, uh, not to put their budget in a like a hard position or or to get more from this transaction they apply these counter trade um, applications so in 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 its essence this is the trade that has been done by countries who are transaction uh, who are doing defense tra um, uh, trade from mostly the developing countries who are buying the product they are trying to get more of the technology or uh, more of the investments that they can get from this trade so what they do is they uh, they come up with these regulations that proposes an offset trade uh, uh, offsets sorry rate which means the rate to apply to the actual cost of the transaction to find the total credits to be fulfilled by the buyer. So it's let's say that uh, the transaction is $1 million and uh, you have 40% uh, of offset trade. Um, so this means that the, the buyer uh, will require the seller to compensate this, this trade in, 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 in a value of uh, $400,000. Of course, this is not directly money this is just the credits so how to earn the, these um credits you can um you can as the seller uh, propose uh transferring some the, some of the technologies that you have you can train people in the or in the buyer's country or you can invest in infrastructure or but you can buy something back from um from the buyer country, or you can integrate them into your production. So you can basically, let's say, Turkey buys F-16s from Lockheed Martin, but some of its parts are produced in Turkey as a compensation. So in, in those credits, there's also the, this concepts of multipliers. So not every dollar is equal. So the buyer regulates multipliers to incentivize the seller to fulfill those credits in prioritized areas. So let's say that you would prefer um, training people um, and te te technology transfer over uh, investment on infrastructure. So you can just, as, as the buyer country, you can just change the multipliers accordingly so that the seller would prefer fulfilling their credits by investing in those areas. There is also the two more there, there are lots of uh, concepts, but two more concepts that I will talk about now. Uh, one of them is thresholds. The other is uh, the second is penalties. The thresholds are the thresholds of the trade, which means below this um, threshold, uh, the, the, the transactions below this threshold do not trigger the regulations. Um, and also the penalties are the, the penalties are the sanctions if applied if the commitments by the seller are not fulfilled so the seller pays a penalty so uh, in the literature offsets are defense offsets are like very much um uh criticized like not criticized but that their contributions are like very skeptically evaluated people um that most of the scholars argue that they do not contribute as much as they promise also, the risks are always stable because most of the seller companies, because they come up with this uh, compensation package, they add it on the total price of the of the product. So the costs are mostly stable, but benefits are not promised. So it works in some time. So it turns into sustainable jobs in, in, in some cases, and it doesn't in others. So in let's go. Let's come back to Turkish case. Um, Turkey started producing defense policies uh, in starting from 1985 with the establishment of the Office for Defense Industrialization. Of course, before this, there was attempts to, but it was not holistically defense uh, policy creation, but more like 
uh, individual solutions to individual problems. So the, one of the main focus of Turkey um, was trying to integrate in the international projects and transfer technology uh, and train people as much as they could. So in the until the 2000s, uh, defense officers were, were quite central in the Turkish defense industrialization. Um, one prominent example is the F-16 project between Turkey and Lockheed Martin, uh, which gave Turkey the like most of the experience on its aviation uh, industry today, which you also can see in the in the Turkish drones that are operating in various theaters of the world. Um, in 2004, Turkey switched to local production from international participation. So rather than trying to go expand, learn from the existing, um, existing project, Turkey focused more on producing local solutions on local problems in 2004. So how this is how, how this reflects itself on defense offsets and how the uh, regulations change. So before 2003, so there's like basically five uh, regulation in 1991 and 2000, before 2002, and 2003, 2007, and 2011, after 2002, and until the two, 2000, uh, until today, let's say. So the, the, the the regulations before 2002 basically were mostly on uh, defense industrialization. In, in 1991, the offset rate was 50% and penalty was uh, 10%. The sectors that it was regulated for was defense sector, electronic sector, aviation, and medical sector. And the firms that defense offsets were applied to was foreign uh, companies. There was no threshold uh, threshold um, decided, and the theme was defense industrialization. So it was increasing the procurement capacity of the Turkish defense uh, industrial base. In 2002, um, nothing changed. Uh, of course, nothing changed much apart from coming up with a threshold of $5 million, because then the number of the um, projects increase and, 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 and it started to create some uh, confusion. So they need to prioritize the, the bigger, um, bigger uh, deals. Also, they added the aviation and space, they, they expanded the aviation industry to space industry and also software and communications uh, were also added uh, to the, under, the, under the title of the electronic uh, industry. In 2003, Offset rates remained 50%. Again, then the penalties remained 10%. And the sectors um, remained the same. Um, but, uh, but yeah, sorry, the, the sectors become more, more definite. But threshold firm, the theme didn't change um, three, in, in three years, between 2000 and 2003. But starting from 2007, um, the offset rate remaining 50% again, penalty, penalties were decreased to 6%. Uh, and also sectors were shrinked back to defense, aviation, and space. Also, firms are not only foreign firms right now, the, 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 who the defense offsets are applying to, but also the local firms. And the threshold increased to the $10 million. Uh, and th this is, this change shows us that the, that, that uh, after increasing the general industrialization in defense, in 2007, Turkish defense offsets go back to the, its initial center of defense, aviation, and space. But I also, but it also, since it had some companies of Turkey grow uh, globally in those years, they also started to apply the defense offsets on the local companies to, cre to create sustainable growth within the defense industrialization, to create an ecosystem in which that smaller or small to medium enterprises could also benefit from the defense transaction between the local companies um, and the foreign companies. 
And in 2011, the offsets rate increased to 70% from 50%. Penalty remained the same, sectors remained the same, and also from, again, uh, foreign and local. But then the threshold were uh, threshold uh, was uh, um, removed. So in all transactions on defense, aviation, and space in, um, in Turkey, all foreign and local companies are subject to defense offsets um, regulations. But in 2021, according to retired Lieutenant General um, Alpasan Erdogan, offsets become um, less and less influential because it worked in 19th and in the early 20s on defense industrialization. And then it helped with the defense um, uh, ecosystem building. And now it's it started to covering some specific big expenditures, including Turkish Airlines uh, purchase of aircrafts, because it's also, um, although it's not a defense related uh, purchase, it has similar uh, features of being, uh, being a, a very big uh, transaction, um, aviation, it's an aviation uh, expenditure and so on and so on. So it, it started to get more and more dissolved into the general expenditures of Turkish industrialization. Up, so it, 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 it completed its um, mission in the defense industrialization part because now Turkey imports less because it produces more. So you don't have that kind of uh, um, technology transfer need that much as, as Turkey needed before. So this is my presentation. Uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Mehmet. And uh, I also we have a question uh, to you for the Q&A, and you can, you can think about it. Uh, you partially answered it. I mean, it was very interesting, and, and uh, you are absolutely right that, uh, that in most cases, uh, the offsets are kind of are disappointing for the buyer. In most of the cases, it is, it is, it is, it is the experience. But it seems to me that based on your presentation, that Turkey is different or Turkey perceived the, the, the offset in a different way. Uh, so, so my question is, do you see that Turkey's approach to offset was different based on, on the regulations and based on the policies than, than other countries? And it is the reason why uh, it is perceived as a more successful model or or it was not more successful, just Turkey used it for uh, developing and building up its own defense industry. And it was the, it was the strategic goal. So this, this is my question. And, and you can, we can come back after all the presentations. Mm -hmm. OK, excellent. Uh, thank you, Mehmet. So Onur Kara uh, is the next one. Onur is, is, uh, is uh, also a PhD student at King's College London, but he is a PhD student at the War Studies Department. He's also a graduate teaching assistant at King's and also a tutor at uh, Royal College of Defense Studies. And uh, his research is uh, focusing on Tunisia, how institutional change in post-authoritarian military regimes are going on. And uh, uh, he's focusing on the Tunisian military transformation. Onur, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Uh, today, actually, I would like to talk about uh, military who has learned a lot. I mean, it's increasingly emerging as a case of successful transition, right? But I'm going to argue that all this transformation and learning process actually might be happening for not necessarily for the correct reasons. Uh, the case I would like to talk a bit is the case of Tunisia, right? Uh, Tunisian military, just to give a brief background, uh, in 2010, just at the outset of the Arab uprising, it was a rather modest force of 30,000 uh, troops, which is organized around three mechanized brigades and one territorial brigade, which is a very modest force. And it was you, very briefly, very generally considered as the, you know, the quintessential coup proof military because of the restrictions it faced uh, in order to enact coup prevention measures under the Benalese regime. Just to give a couple of examples to illustrate the extent of change occurred that the military was usually uh, 
considered not being able to operate far away from its logistic depots before 2010. It was quite simply not expected to fight. And the last purchase they made for their combined arms warfare capabilities was actually made in 1984. So by the time Arab Spring happened, they were actually far than outdated. And the entire military doctrine of the country, if you like, was actually based on, you know, resisting, uh, based on resisting external aggression for 24 to 48 hours during which time they expected foreign reinforcements probably from Europe or the United States to arrive. So it was essentially a military which was not expected to engage in any prolonged conflict, right? But once you look at this uh, military after 2011, now we see that they have increased their budget significantly. They successfully fought a counterterrorism campaign in Tunisia's borderlands, and they kept participating in peacekeeping missions. And in general, it was the same in my fieldwork in Tunisia and in the secondary literature as well. They, they are met with almost universal acclaim. I, they had to say that for being either a good, if you like, I don't like the term student, but as a student of uh, international cooperation programs or a good partner, if you like. And also in terms of their own capability to, you know, to increase the capabilities using the domestic sources, despite the relative limited capabilities of uh, being a small country. So I would like to keep most of this uh, presentation or speech, if you like, as actually empiricals. And I will specifically talk about two things which show that the Tunisian military growth after uh, 2011 has been lopsided. The first is that the country actually kept having very serious recruitment problems, being a military which traditionally relied on uh, conscripts. And second, and rel relatedly, the country and Tunisians started over-relying on special operations forces, which and this later point is actually where my research is currently evolving, as I think that those two patterns are interrelated and they actually show a couple of problems that indicate a wider regional pattern which goes beyond uh, Tunisia as well. So I think uh, Tunisia is a rather interesting case in this regard. I believe that uh, it was one of the most understudied militaries in the region, but after 2011, now there's excellent work coming out of the civil military relations in particular, uh, both from the United States and also from France as well. But uh, what I would say that the, my concern in this research is much more traditional and more interested in their military capabilities and force organization and uh, things like that. And what makes Tunisia theoretically quite interesting is that except literature, especially in the last 10 years, there has been a very significant amount of push, if you like, to understand how authoritarian military forces are organized. Also, that sometimes extends to their internal security forces as well. And we also have a significant amount of literature, an older one, if you like, which analyzes the uh, sources of military doctrine and, and the military organization in established democracies or in great powers. But the uh, or understanding of how this relationship works and evolves when a country transitions to form an uh, authoritarian regime to a democracy is much less understood. So I think the case of Tunisia has, uh, might have some benefits in terms of theory building there as well. Then uh, I would like to start a bit about talking about recruitment in this case. What happened in uh, Tunisia after 2011 is that uh, given that their police force was defeated in the revolution, if you like, the military was increasingly drawn into policing and counterterrorism duties because of political reasons. That, uh, however, caused a number of very serious problems immediately for their military high command because they quite simply did not have enough people. Having a force of around 35,000 people, they had to deploy at, some, at one point 22,000 troops to the ground in order to secure the elections in October 2011. And similar kinds of public order deployments continued until all the way uh, three years into the revolution, which actually created significant uh, problems within the military. In order to solve this problem, what Tunisians did was to you know, get back to their uh, get back to their traditional recruitment practices, which was the goal uh, conscription. But that I was very problematic. What they did is, 
uh, Tunisian uh, lawmakers uh, facing manpower shortages, they actually reignited the debate on compulsory military service in uh, 2016. The defense ministry declared that they wanted to train uh, 12,000 soldiers that year, which would actually be divided to three intakes of 3,000 conscripts. So after several years of you know, lacking in troops, they would be able to get that. But the problem is that immediately become very, very problematic because they realized that in 2017 alone, and I'm actually reading numbers from their defense minister, they have sent 31,000 call-ups for the military training, and only 506 people out of that 31,000 actually completed that training, which is quite optimal for a country which relies on conscription to fill their ranks. So obviously, because of all historical reasons or, or, or the capability issues, the country is not able to actually fill their ranks. And even if they managed to do so, they also saw that the mobilization, the mobilization circle that actually cycle that is required to you know, establish a full force will require 60,000 individuals to be trained because due to Tunisia's young population, if they force it on everyone. Military training facilities in Tunisia, on the other hand, only had a capacity around one fourth of it, around 50,000 trainees and distributed amongst 10 camps in the country. So quite simply, they found themselves in a position which cannot be sold by you know, throwing more money or the budget at the problem alone. That's a very you know, uh, path dependent capability issue. And that brings it to the second a part of my uh, talk, if you like, which is the solution they found, which is to rely even further on the special operations forces. Now, what happens in Tunisia is that they, they do not have a uh, unified military command or a training on doctrine command where you can, can actually you know, trace the development of doctrine or force development. But being a democratizing country, what happened is uh, there is now a debate on Tunisia where retired military officers and the people are able to, you know, uh, uh, raise their concerns about the military and the public, including newspapers, if you like. So tracing that debate, if you like, I was able to, you know, find two camps in Tunisia, which, you know, advocating where the military should go. The camp number one are the traditionalists, if you like, and they argue for, you know, pushing for what I have been narrating so far. They argue that the country needs to keep, you know, pushing for establishing a regular military force and equip the conscription because it's the national duty. And I think this is uh, taking quite a bit from the French perspective as well, they are I mean, many of them are French trained. But the second camp, actually, and taking support from the, uh, overseas, military, the overseas military training from United States and the, the recent uh, you know engagement in counterterrorism as well, I think that Tunisia needs to go for a much more leaner force, if you like, something much more based on air force and the special operations force and a force which is quite explicitly aimed at you know. Uh, countering non-conventional threats, if you like, rather than any conventional threat from Libya they would have expected 10 years ago. So, so, and from what's been happening in the ground, we was able to discover that the second camp, the lean one, and the more innovative one, if you like, has been uh, winning out, but this is not necessarily for the reasons that are uh, good for the country. For example, starting from 2017, the country has established a couple of rapid, uh, rapid intervention brigades, you know, very similar to the American model, and they have been deploying them. And the uh, Special Operations uh, Command in Bizat in northern Tunisia has emerged as pretty much the one single most important unit in the entire armed forces. And actually, they have been engaging an operational tempo, which is actually more than threefold of what we had they have experienced before the Arab uprising. And secondly, I found that uh, looking at their uh, training programs and their uh, track record of military procurement, I realized that the Tunisia did almost nothing to actually to implement its combined arms capabilities since 2011. Those old tanks I mentioned from 1984 are still there. All new purchases are armored cars, UAVs, and, and the equipment that are related to small arms uh, and the counterterrorism. But I argue that many of these programs are actually driven not by uh, external threat, but but that the problems that the country is facing, especially for especially because that many of the special operations missions in Tunisia right now are not based on what the special operations forces are actually for. I mean, intelligence gathering or training the local militias. In contrast, despite their prevalence, the vast majority of special forces in Tunisia are being used in direct combat missions, and which leads us to think that they are. This is a way of uh, compensating for regular military weakness rather than through military innovation or going for a lean force. 
So I would argue that despite, uh, you know, uh, arguing for some, so despite uh, uh, achieving, if you like, uh, some short-term successes, which is very laudable, by the way, uh, this material transition in Tunisia is, is starting to reflect a couple of uh, structural problems, if like, in the country. And uh, for the future, in, far, in particular, I argue that this uh, increased role of special operations forces it needs more security in the Arab world because despite their prevalence, we still do not know. Uh, are, those, are, those, are the prevalence of those forces is it because of diffusion? Is the question of uh, islands of efficiency as a political economist will say, or are they a continuation of coup profit practices? Or finally, is this an uh, accounting trick in a way to you know, see that more capabilities are being added as the forces get smaller and smaller, I think. Uh, this was a very uh, popular criticism in the United Kingdom a few years back. Yeah, I think this is my uh, time end, so thank excellent, you. Excellent, excellent. So my question to you is that you are you talked about the different camps, that they are kind of, it is also in the literature that innovation or learning happens often when different camps in the armed forces try to outsmart each other. So it is, my question will be, it is it is the driving force in innovation and reform in Tunisia or, or something else. So just when... Uh, Tamaris finishes the presentation. Uh, let's come back to this question. Tam Tamaris Santos is our next presenter. She is a, a PhD student at uh, Cranford University and also a member of the Defense uh, Research Network. And uh, she's going to uh, give a presentation about how change and transformation can happen and what kind of institutional interoperability can be identified as a factor that drives and sustains military change. Uh, Tamaris, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Professor. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ah, that's perfect. Uh, many thanks and apologies for my belated uh, drawing. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, following our discussions and transformation, uh, my presentation uh, is slightly more general and focused on the process of transformation itself. So my apologies in advance if I am eventually repetitive uh, after the brilliant speech of all my colleagues. So I would like to briefly discuss with you the relation between uh, institutional interoperability and transformation as uh, understood as a major scale military change in process. So first things first, well, uh, I think that uh, it's just too good to put some remarks about military transformation. Uh, basically, uh, in terms of process, uh, at the center of transformation connects a lot with the revolution of the military affairs happened after the post of war in the US. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Despite the frank diffusion of transformation across other parts of the globe, uh, as my colleagues have talked about uh, Tunisia, Turkey, France, uh, we have here in Latin America as well, uh, there are some issues uh, in the process of adoption of such a major scale uh, military change like transformation. So uh, some issues are uh, pointed out by the literature, uh, like the domestic context affecting the adoption capacity of the state to promote this process. Uh, the geopolitic, ge geopolitics is also a very inflation factor to, in the adoption of such process. Uh, as long as uh, organization of capital and financial intensity also are on the line uh, as signed by Wojtovich and other authors. Uh, but uh, it's interesting enough uh, to notice that uh, Sir Lawrence Friedman, for instance, ever since the beginning of this process also uh, uh, brought that for every RMA, there is also an RPA, the revolution of political class, as it happened here in Britain. So, uh, it is a very complex process of adopting such a change, uh, be it based in, uh, on uh, innovation, uh, technology, and other, uh, other aspects that are, in, are encompassed by such a uh, process. So, 
Uh, other issues that we have uh, moving on are the principles. Uh, as, military, as a military change, uh, we can detect that some principles are common uh, comparing with the transformation and military change in general. Uh, it involves always a doctrine change uh, in order to set the uh, new guidelines, shared values and visions, uh, organizational cut and learning in order to sustain this process. And it's, it can be considered as a major change once it, the result of any transformation is the creation of the path of a very uh, brand new institution. So uh, across military change literature, uh, any of you can observe that uh, different uh, aspects uh, play a central role uh, in order to give birth to these institutions. But the biggest question in terms of change and process adoption is how to perform those changes where uh, old values are reinforced, proceeding a uh, great part of the times uh, the process of transformation itself. For that, I think that uh, as soon as I'm concerned uh, with my research, uh, it's necessary to have a responsive and robust structure. And that's why uh, our interoperability comes uh, to, the, to the ground because, well, even though we have a lot of different uh, definitions for this phenomenon, interoperability can be understood as a measure of the degree to which various organizations or individuals are able to operate together to achieve a common goal. It's pretty, pretty similar to the concept of jointness, jointry, and joint operations. But uh, if I can uh, make some distinction here, uh, there is interoperability outside uh, jointry and joint military operations, but the opposite is not true. So, uh, this term is basically native from systems engineering on uh, information systems literature. And we brought here yeah, to defense studies and military operations in order to uh, take a category of the contemporary warfare with the birth of uh, joint military operations. But as I uh, was telling some uh, a minute before, uh, we have a wide range of interpretations of this concept. Uh, in the literature, we can find something like in the order of 35 different definitions. It's very complex to, to make uh, a meaning of it. But as, apart from that, I think that the uh, greatest difficulty to talk about it is that in the document, defense documents across the world, it's seen as a name associated with military effectiveness increase, but it's also seen as means to achieve integration and military effectiveness. So what is it anyway? And how much do you need to do you need from it? When, where, how to raise it? So the consensus here is clear that we have more questions than answers when it comes to this theme and when it comes to sustaining uh, military change based on this uh, phenomenon, be it a capability, a name, or means. But just to add one, one more complexity to that, a bit more complexity to that, uh, interoperability goes far beyond uh, data and info exchange and the operational aspect of uh, defense. We have the non-technical aspect of interoperability that posit uh, everything about the preparedness uh, of the single services in the field, the coordination and command, the ethos, the understanding how it's shared, the styles of command and the like, and how it responds to the environment. And that connects with the domestic and international context of applying uh, 
different uh, a different range of military changes in it includes transformation. So uh, it means that uh, we depend on a framework to make it happen. So uh, the bunch of questions that I just presented, like when, where, what, how much, who, and how much of interoperability is needed into a certain context means that we need a governance uh, design well established. And it's a precondition to enable it properly and uh, to know where we will go and where this transformation will lead us to. As I told you, so, uh, I'm, uh, it's quite unfortunate. Uh, I am from the mobile phone and I can't show you the, the slides. Uh, you would be uh, more familiar with uh, the complexity of how interoperability unfolds, but uh, basically uh, it's not just summing up uh, preparedness plus understanding plus command and control plus coordination. It's not linear like that. It deals with the interactions of a uh, broad range of components inside of these categories. And it's greater than the sum of its parts. That's why it's so complex to measure and to address it. Uh, but uh, on the top of that, uh, it's also seen in, by the literature as a source of organizational sustainability because it, uh, it relates with the endurance, the adaptation, and the continuity of organizational change, including transformation. So just to summarize here, uh, achieving interoperability uh, basically can enable sustainable transformation adoption because it's not just starting the process, it's continuing it, sustaining it until its end, until we have uh, the birth of a new institution uh, across the different parts of the globe. And in this sense, uh, both, we can think that both interoperability and transformation uh, are understood as means to achieve greater military effectiveness, as we've seen replicated across uh, national defense doctrines and defense white papers from all over the world. So the hypothesis here that we can infer is that the more interoperability, the more responsiveness to change, consequently, the greater propensity to adopt transformation successfully. And well, the great challenge in the end of the day is how to address, track and measure interoperability and its impacts on military change to achieve uh, transformation successfully, uh, independently on where uh, it is established. So I uh, thank you very much for the opportunity of being here for your time and many thanks again. Thank you, Tamir. It's, no, it's, it's, very, it's very interesting. And I also have a question for you while the others uh, are coming uh, for the Q&A. So it's, uh, it seemed to me that, uh, so you agree with Eric, Eric Schmidt it used to be the former chief executive officer of Google, and he was in the Pentagon Advisory Board on Innovation. What he said that, that the Pentagon didn't have an innovation problem, it had an innovation adaptation problem. So basically there were lots of good ideas in there, but the adoption part was, was was very difficult because of different reasons. So, so my first question is: Do you agree with that? Uh, and the second question is: uh, If no, why not? If yes, what is the main reason? It is uh, the reason that you mentioned the uh, interoperability is the main issue about the uh, adopting uh, innovations and the new practices or something else. Uh, but you have time to think about it because now I will come back to Lucy. Uh, and uh, I'm just uh, uh, asking her again. So, how do you see that these 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 themes that you mentioned are there? It, it was, if I remember well, uh, full spectrum of capabilities, experienced army, army, and general approach to transformation. So these themes are stable. Are they helping transformation, or they are a little bit uh, pulling back and generating more stagnation? Well, for me, um, that's why ontological security is useful for the study of transformation, because it actually provides a framework to 
to better understand transformation and to better understand the resistance uh, in the militaries to transform. You mentioned earlier, there's mm. this reluctance to change and we don't really, in the military transformation literature, we don't really look at why is there this resistance? Mm. And that's what ontological security mm. comes in to help to answer this, because I think it provides that framework to understand that when you look at transformation, when you look at change, you also need to look at what doesn't change. And when I'm talking about the quest of balance, I was obviously looking at the balance there is to be in the French model, but it's also more generally in transformation. There's this balance between continuity and change that's need to, to always be kind of articulated because there's this need for being ontologically secure. So not letting go of things that make your identity, be it for the nation or for the military. But there's also this requirement to evolve and adapt to the evolution of the world. So there's this kind of like balance between the two that needs to be articulated and I think on some things it can slow down transformation but on others it can also um, gives the strength of the model that's why I tried to show with uh, the French model that there's some kind of strength and weaknesses in a model that wants to do a lot with not so much and ontological security helps to un answer this and better understand it. Um, you also mentioned in your question earlier the comparison with the UK uh, which I think is really interesting because it's actually something I'm developing in my thesis. So it's another chapter I'm working on. Um, and I think it's quite natural to make a tie between those two uh, nations, because again, if we look at ontological security, there's this desire for both nations that are fallen empires that want to maintain the status. And that kind of drives um, also their model. But if you take on, again, ontological security, you understand the differences. And although they've got the same objective of having high, high ambitions and power projecting and that global reach, they both end up having very different models. And ontological security helps us understand how culture and identity shape um, different evolutions. Excellent. No, excellent. No, I, it's, it's, it's just fascinating. And you know, I, so usually I, I read papers uh, about these issues from organization management perspective and so on. I really like the concept of uh, ontological security and it's, I think it's, it's a great gap in the literature that you found that never, no one really answered the transformation, military transformation from this uh, theoretical perspective. So great, it's, I, I think it, it, I'm looking forward to read your research in the future. Thank Excellent. Uh, Mehmet, uh, so just quickly, uh, what do you think? Was it, what was the, offset regulations and policy in Turkey more successful than in other uh, countries or just the perception is different or how do you see this? Um, I, th I think it might provide a different case, an exceptional case. Um, this is also what I try to basically focus on my PhD, but of course I don't frame the question as, as how the offsets work, but uh, I frame it as, as the following. Most of the countries that use offsets are also developing countries who have different problems with defense industrialization. So I think uh, some of the problems of defense industrialization in these countries who are external to defense offsets are also thought of um, as the consequences of the offsets. So I think uh, how I try to frame Turkey as a different case is that uh, Turkey is a case that actually defense industrialization worked to some extent. There's this sustainable growth and the offsets are used in it. So offsets might A, show an exceptional case in this one and B, might be still disappointing. Um, but still, since the industrialization is uh, more or less sustainable compared to other cases, um, so it might not be very visible that offsets didn't work. So I, I think the, 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 the interesting part is in here, like whoever needs offsets might fail defense industrialization and whoever who doesn't need offsets uh, are mostly the developed countries like United States and, and there is no uh, offsets regulation internally in, in the EU. So uh, most of the cases about developing and defense industrialization in itself, I think. I hope the, that's an answer. No, 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 absolutely, absolutely. No, no, it's, it's a very good, very good answer. Thank you very much. No, it's great. It's great. Now, I didn't know the Turkey case. It seems to be fascinating. So, 
It's great, 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 great case selection. Excellent. I see from the from the attendees, from the audience, that Claire Hurst is raising her hands. I don't know how to give you uh, uh, the microphone. So if you could just type down your question in the Q and A box, that would be that would be great. Uh, Honor. So about Tunisia. So what is the driving force behind this surprisingly rapid transformation and change? Because which is not not I would say a kind of uh, regular thing in armed forces. So we can see that in Tunisia for the last decade, there was lots of change. And you mentioned one of them, it just caught my attention that, that the, the different camps try to outsmart each other. And it is one of the, one of the, one of the themes that the literature brings up that in these cases, a transformation uh, might happen faster. Do you think that it is a driving force before we had a transformation or something else? Yeah, I think that's definitely possible given that you know, many of the individual units are actually, you know, comp are engaged in some sort of co bureaucratic competition as well with each other, right? Because what you see is when you see this increased budget, you know, coming inside the country, so then what happens is, you know, it's a slice to be pie to be had. So the, it's not just the military as well, they also compete with the internal ministry as well with the So if you saw yeah, that is pretty much complete. And one thing perhaps I can add to that as well is the impact of the external aid because most of these techniques, capability, and equipment is actually coming from you know, overseas assistance. So I think they're not just outsmarting each other, trying to outsmart each other. They're also trying to outbid each other to receive that specific training. As so you want your troops rather than you know, this other directorate to take that training. So I think this has been, uh, that might have generated a feedback loop, which you know, increased the process even uh, further than it would otherwise. Yeah. Excellent. So what you say that that basically is two two things, two factors that you, it's it's worth to looking at it. One of them is it's coming from outside. So this is the driving force, the outside support, which also makes lots of sense. And also the other one is the internal kind of competition. In the oh, it's it's it, it can generate very interesting dynamics. So it's good, good, excellent, excellent. Uh, Tamaris, uh, you you told us a great amount of how transformation happens or doesn't happen and what are the problems is. And I just uh, mentioned one of the quotes from Eric Schmidt. Do you agree with Eric Schmidt? He talked about the Pentagon, uh, but do you agree that uh, innovation adaptation is a more problem than innovating in general for armed forces or innovation is problem per se? And, and, uh, and what is the main reason the problems of innovation adaptation? It is what you mentioned, the, the uh, interoperability or there are other factors that we might take into consideration too. Uh, thank you, Professor. Basically, uh, I don't think that we can uh, compare uh, these two processes uh, quite uh, quite in the same with the same weight. It's not the same weight, and it's not the same causation for both of them. Because, well, uh, adaptation uh, it needs some ground. Of and some degree of responsiveness inside of the organization. So uh, once we trigger the first change, uh, and we are talking about adapting something, we are taking something that already exists, and you are adapting to different contexts. So uh, the the proceedings and ta taking here a hook from uh, on your uh, Oh, uh, we need some feedback loops inside the system to, uh, to guarantee this responsiveness. And when you are trying to totally innovate, uh, even though we, uh, we know that any innovation doesn't come from nothing, it comes from the combination of existing technology or existence techniques with, with different uh, categories to different applications, uh, we can face uh, greater resistance because you don't know, it's, you never know if it will be successfully adopted. So we can adjust uh, the system accordingly uh, and their structures to accommodate that uh, novel situation, that novel technology. But uh, in the case of relating all of that with interoperability, I think that uh, we, in terms of adaptation, uh, it's required uh, 
an already very robust and responsive organization to keep it going. And in order to innovate, we need to establish uh, this uh, structure first. Uh, we need to establish the responsiveness to that innovation. So it's a whole chain that we need to cascade down all the different areas of the organization to make it work. Uh, if I was to give an example, uh, I really don't, I'm not totally familiar with the US defense sector in a whole, as a whole. I am a bit more familiar with the uh, British uh, case that I've been studying for, for a while. And when, we're, when jointery was established in Great Britain, the first step was institutionalizing the joint command and the permanent joint headquarters. And afterwards, we had a, a series of reviews, including the strategic defense review, the institutional of uh, the joint services commanders at college, and all a uh, great structure to accommodate that major scale change. And now adapting it from now on, as we've seen with a lot of different doctrines, different strategic documents and the like, it's a way easier than making this innovation to go on again, this organizational innovation. What I mean is that uh, innovation takes a while longer, even though it's a technological one or organizational one, and it's, it's a way more difficult to make it happen. But adaptation uh, without a strong structure will not be able to trigger uh, the change. It will not be able to break the inertia of that organization. I, I think I, I don't know if I answered yeah, no, no, your question. Absolutely. Thank you. But Thank I you. Hope right. so. Thank you. No, it's absolutely a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good points. Good points here. That is a very, very tricky one. Um, and uh, we don't have too many too much time. Uh, Lucy, if you could answer in one minute uh, this question that we got from uh, Carl in the in the in the, in the question box. Oh, sorry about that. So my uh, computer just for them. So it's uh, the question is about uh, uh, multinational and multidisciplinary teams in different operations. How does it uh, uh, affect transformation? Um, so I think, like I highlighted my kind of presentation highlighted the influence of culture and identity and I think it's important to keep in mind that it plays a role when you're thinking of interoperability and cooperation with partners but it's also important to keep in mind that um, today nations are especially the nations in the west that work together the nations that are under NATO they're highly standardized so they, they've made an effort they know that um, networking is a mass multiplier for armies that are really strong. So they know that they need this to, to work together. So they have standardized. And even if there is some elements of culture that can come in between cooperation, I think that generally they do have a model that facilitates that cooperation. Um, here I'm talking more about state on state because that's what I know, that's what I'm also looking at in, in my thesis. So I'm not sure how this would also work on, on another level, but I think the fact that they're aiming to be standardized um, does is, is relevant. Uh, I'd also say for France in that case, um, like I highlighted, it, it wants to be um, to keep that strategic autonomy and it has ambitions. And one of their new kind of the route they're taking now is to kind of present themselves as a strategic um, framework, like a nation framework when they work in cooperation. So still taking that leader role that also leave them the, the space to act mm -hmm. in the way they want to. So I think that's also interesting to keep in mind that there's still this element of culture coming in. So I don't know if well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic, great. This, uh, I think the, uh, ontological security framework is very useful here. So thank you, thank you for your answer. And thank you for all of the presenters. So thank you, uh, Lucy, thank you, uh, uh, Mehmet, Onur and Tamiris. Uh, we learned a lot from different aspects of innovation and transformation today from you. And thank you for presenting your uh, research insights. Uh, it, it was very, very useful and I really enjoyed it. And uh, I would like to thank you for attendees and our audience for joining us. 
and hope they liked uh, uh, our presentation as well. So uh, I hope that you can you can join our, our attendees to the uh, uh, sessions that are coming after us. And uh, and thank you again for coming and have a lovely day.